the strangest death in national park history. Now, um, as I've said before on other live streams that um, I've covered, uh, I have for years been going to national parks and whenever it is available I get the death in books right like death in Yellowstone death in Grand Canyon death in Yosemite I've been to Sequoia Kings Canyon I think three times two or three times and I don't think they had one for that particular park um at least they didn't at that time in their bookstores, right? Because I always look for them. That's usually like my pastime reading while I'm camping. You know, when the kids are just th throwing the ball around or something, I'll be sitting in a camp chair reading these types of books. And so that's, that's why, plus I have, I have an uncle that's a ranger, right? So, so that's why I want to cover this story. I have no idea what's about to happen. Um, uh, so I don't know how, but I, I do know Sequoia Kings Canyon. I know what the terrain looks like. Um, it looks like these pictures that they're putting up in the beginning here are in the Kings Canyon portion of the park, but it's, um, it's, it's a very steep terrain at times. Um, there's, uh, the valley where Kings Canyon is, is kind of like a smaller version of Lake Yosemite, much smaller, right? Um, definitely not as majestic as, um, uh, Yosemite, but it's, it's absolutely filled with, uh, sequoia trees, groves up and down the park, and there's also, um, some caves. There's caves with that um are very deep and they do tours of them um and there are some steep precipices and this particular uh park is right basically below um i think it's mount whitney it's like the steepest I think it, that's the steepest mountain in the continental U.S. Uh, I believe that's what it is. It's like right below Mount Whitney. So there's a very steep mountain range right next to the valley. And well, let's see. Let's see what happens here. Few people were more experienced in the remote backcountry of the Sierra Nevada mountains than James Randall Morganson, also known as Randy. I say this because Randy Morganson spent 27 seasons as a park ranger in Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks. For 27 years, he patrolled these harsh mountains, helping out hikers along the way and working to protect the environment of the pristine national parks. Now, 27 seasons is a lot, but the truth is... It should have been 28. Honestly, it should have been even more than that because mm -hmm. one day while on a routine patrol of the backcountry, Randy Morganson vanished. At first, his disappearance seemed likely to be an accident because after all, the terrain that he was working in was very, very tough. But after troubling details of Randy's personal life became known, the possibility that his disappearance might have been intentional became more and more real this is the tragic story of randy morganson okay my goal is to get this channel to 100,000 subscribers i have a long ways to go please help me get to that goal hit that subscribe button i'll give you a second seems like you you did okay thank you Let's talk about Randy Morganson. Randy Morganson spent more than half of his life working as a backcountry ranger in Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks. In 1996, Randy was 54 years old and began his 28th season with the Park Service. I hiked through Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks for the first time last year in 2022. And so after witnessing this terrain firsthand, I can tell you straight up, it's crazy there. I've mm -hmm. hiked thousands of miles in my life and the terrain in Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Park is 
right up there at the top in terms of just the most like out of this world stuff I've ever done. You're surrounded by rugged mountains as tall as 14,000 feet above sea level. There's tons of freezing cold alpine lakes and there's also an endless amount of fast flowing rivers. The fact that Randy Morganson had so many years of experience in such a harsh environment puts him at an elite level of backcountry skill. Unseen threats can yeah. lurk undetected in your hybrid cloud environment. The other thing, too, is um, that uh, they we don't have grizz grizzlies in the Sierra Nevada. So um, we have uh, black bears. Now, I don't know if this is the case for Sequoia Kings Canyon, but I do know that Yosemite has never, which is just north of it, right? It's j slightly north of this area. Um, they have never had a bear kill anybody like they've um i don't even think they've really had a mauling you know um so i think it unlikely that he had some sort of like bear encounter but let, let's see what happens here it should be no surprise to hear that with all that experience, he was the most senior ranger that was patrolling in the High Sierra. In 1996, Randy Morganson was working at the Bench Lake Ranger Station, which is just off of the John Muir Trail slash Pacific Crest Trail. On July 20th, okay. he reported his position via park radio as being at Mather Pass on the PCT. The next day on July 21st, he departed from the Bench Lake Ranger Station and left a note saying that he was going to be going on patrol for just a few days. At some point during this day, a few hikers allegedly spoke with Randy somewhere along the John Muir slash Pacific Crest Trail. And they reported that during this interaction, Randy was in good spirits. But in very tragic fashion, this would be the last contact that anybody ever had with Randy Morganson. And his radio contact from the previous day would be the last time that the Park Service ever heard from him. It wouldn't be long before a desperate search for him began and questions about his personal life began being raised. While spending time in nature is certainly a positive for a lot of people's mental health, it's not a cure-all. And unfortunately, Randy's case proves this. Going into the 1996 season, it's been and reported that Randy Morganson was suffering from depression. He even had a conversation with another park ranger in... Oh, that sucks. But yeah, the other thing is that when you do start, if you do read through some of the stories of what happens in these parks, because these are some of the most beautiful places in the country, and in some cases in the world, um, they attract a lot of strange fellows, right? So, especially like Yosemite. Yosemite had a lot of stories of like um, serial killers who would come to the park. Um, or people who had really weird um, like domestic violence type situations. There's at least two stories in um, Death in Yosemite where like one dude threw his um, partner. I think it was a... I don't know if it was a girlfriend or a wife off of the top of Upper Yosemite Falls, which is um, one of the top four tallest waterfalls in the world. And the another one that I that I can think of off the top of my head was a crazy dude who did basically the same thing, but he did it over at um Glacier Point, which also is a, a very, I think it's like 4,000 feet drop. And that dumbass, um, he threw the woman off, um, but then he tried to jump off himself. And it's not exactly a straight drop. So apparently he bounced a lot of the way down and got stuck somewhere in the middle of it which he basically questioned the one thing that he had dedicated his entire adult life to, which was his service as a park ranger. That was definitely not a good sign because, once again, he had dedicated his life to this. He was the most senior ranger in Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks. And while the reasons for his depression aren't explicitly clear, it does seem likely that it had something to do with his strained relationship 
with his wife Judy. I can definitely see how challenging it must be to have a successful marriage when one of the spouses is spending months and months away working in the remote backcountry. I'm assuming here, but I think it's a fair assumption to imagine that this might have had an impact on Randy and his wife's marriage. I did find one report that said his wife had frequently joined him in the mountains, but in the years before his disappearance, she had stopped doing this. I'm not sure how true this is, but either way, it's clear that things were not okay in Randy. Well, I mean, it depends on... It's not only about the relationship at this point, but like, you know, once you start getting into older years, I mean, I'm speaking, you know, kind of in regards for the, the wife in this scenario. The accommodations that they have up there, even for the Rangers, is not great, right? Like, it's not like you're sleeping at home. And our bodies start hurting, right? And if you've been there every year for like, he said it was like 28 seasons, right? You go there every year for like 28 seasons. There may come a time when it's like, eh, I've already seen it all. And, um, you know, the beds don't feel that good. If Even if they, I don't know, if they have cots, beds, if they're sleeping in tents, what they're doing. But I'll tell you, the last time I actually went camping was probably about eight years ago because um, it's getting harder and harder for me to sleep on the ground. I even got, um, I got like a mini cot, like a kind of like a recliner chair that I could sleep on because it was just too painful for my, my joints to sleep on the ground anymore. Um, and prior to that, I had been trying to buy more and more padding to put under my, my sleeping bag. I know my, my brother and his wife, they, they, when they go out now, they have like a full blown air mattress, but I've never really had a lot of success, um, keeping an air mattress to stay firm all night, you know? and Judy's marriage. And to make matters even worse, it's been reported that Randy had recently had an affair with uh -oh. another ranger. And at the start of the 1996 season, Randy had received divorce papers from his wife. Randy Morganson had reportedly told close friend and fellow ranger George Durkee that he had occasionally felt like ending his own life. In fact, the day before Randy went missing, he had had some radio contact with Durkee and Durkee wife and the couple reported that it was a little bit weird like Randy was asking them some questions that he didn't really need the answers to and it kind of just seemed like he was asking the questions over the radio because he wanted somebody to talk to and it got even stranger because at the end of the radio conversation Randy was quoted as saying I won't be bothering you two anymore. Because of this depressed state that Randy was known to have been in, after he went missing, there was a lot of speculation about whether or not it had been an accident and he was still out there somewhere, or if he had intentionally wandered off to potentially take his own life. There was even some other theories as well, such as the suggestion that maybe Randy had been met with foul play. Investigators feared that this might have been a possibility when they learned that on two separate occasions, Randy had been threatened with violence from individuals within the park. However, they determined that both of these suspects had alibis and therefore the foul play theory was eliminated pretty quickly. There was also the theory that perhaps Randy Morganson had just simply fled the park in order to start a new life somewhere. At first, this seemed plausible. However, Randy's car was found parked in its usual spot for when he was going on patrol. And in addition to that, there was never any withdrawals from his bank accounts and his credit cards were never used either. Thus, it seemed like the only two remaining possibilities were that Randy either got lost or he intentionally took his life. And in order to find out which one of these scenarios was true, they needed to search. Randy Morganson was reported missing on July 24th, 1996, and shortly afterwards, the search for him was on. District Ranger Randy Kaufman was in charge of the search, and since many of the searchers were also Randy Morganson's colleagues and friends, he found himself in a unique position. Kaufman wanted to take advantage of the fact that the searchers for Randy were also people that had a personal relationship with him as colleagues. And in order to do this, he conducted a secret ballot 
pilot with all of the rangers. The searchers agreed on a zone that was roughly 80 square miles, which represented the limits of where Randy Morganson could have traveled on a four-day patrol. Kaufman then divided this zone into 16 segments and assigned each segment a letter A through P. Kaufman then interviewed each ranger individually and had them assign a number value to each segment based on the likelihood that they thought Randy was there. And the rangers were also required to assign a number value to a rest of world option, which represented how likely they thought it was that Randy was not inside of the 80 square mile zone. After the secret ballot was completed, the areas with the highest scores were Lake Basin, as seen right here, and Marion Lake, meaning these were the areas that the Rangers collectively believed that Randy had most likely gone to. These were fairly predictable results because Randy had not yet patrolled in either one of those areas in 1996, meaning that they would be good areas for Randy to hit on his next patrol. The rest of world option was voted as the least likely option, indicating that most rangers believed that Randy was still inside the park and still inside that 80 square mile zone. However, there was one ranger that gave the rest of world option an alarmingly high score, and this was ranger George Durkee, who just a few minutes ago I mentioned was one of Randy's close friends. Durkee knew about a lot of the turmoil that was going on in Randy's marriage and his personal life and because of this he believed that randy might have run off somewhere outside of the park to either start a new life or hopefully not but still possibly end his life with all of this input from the rangers a massive search was conducted by july 30th 94 people were on the ground searching five helicopters were scoping out the area from the sky and eight dog teams were attempting to pick up scents a few random pieces of gear were found but none of it was able to be traced to randy search dogs were able to follow a few scents but all of them ended abruptly and they even spotted a suspicious campfire from a helicopter but but they couldn't find anybody that was tending to it. By August 3rd, 1996, the active search for Randy Morganson was called off with no trace of a body and no evidence. Nothing whatsoever. Mm -hmm. For the next five years, Nobody knew what happened to Randy. His missing person flyer remained up at trailheads around the national parks, and individual rangers continued to search for him while they were on their patrols. However, in July of 2001, everything in Randy's case changed. Mm -hmm. On Sunday, July 15th, 2001, a group of off-duty trail crew members were bushwhacking in the area near Window Peak. This part of the National Park has no trail access, and so it's rarely visited and extremely remote. While the group was making its way up a stream northeast of the aforementioned Window Peak, a discarded backpack caught their eye. This would have been very unusual to see in an area that gets so little foot traffic and is so remote. The backpack was found just below some pools of a waterfall, and upon closer investigation, the group discovered a few more items. And one of these items would go on to haunt them, because it was a hiking boot, and sticking out of it was a human leg bone. Investigators flew into the area the day after the discovery was made, and it wasn't long before they were able to conclude that the remains found were in fact Randy Morganson's. They knew this because the gear found matched what Randy had been known to be carrying shortly before his disappearance, and they also found his National Park Service name tag. Dental records were later able to confirm that it was in fact Randy Morganson's remains. So now that Randy had finally been discovered, discovered, the question is, what could have possibly happened to him? A few times earlier in the video, I laid out the two most likely scenarios. The first being it was an accident and he died as a result of that, or he intentionally took his own life. You'd think that the discovery of his... Well, it's also possible he had some sort of medical emergency. If, you know, I mean, obviously you're going to tell us, but like, if you're out in such a remote um, backcountry scenario by yourself which is incredibly unsafe by the way um and say i mean he i think he said he was like 52 right if he had a heart attack out there and he couldn't get medical attention right away he could have died of natural causes and then just been eaten by local wildlife right but that's even like that's even a worse scenario because like 
I know that uh, when they have had um, deaths in Yellowstone from bears, when they have killed, it's usually grizzlies, but there have they have had some maulings in um, Yellowstone. Uh, if they eat a person, though, they the bear has to be tracked down and euthanized because you can't have um, bears out there that um, have tasted humans because then they might try and go after them again, right? Mains would clearly point to one of these circumstances being the truth. But unfortunately, this discovery didn't really give a super clear answer. Let's break down the evidence for each scenario, and let's start by assuming that Randy's death was in fact an accident. First of all, if Randy wanted to end his own life, it's pretty reasonable to assume that he would have done it with a firearm. And the reason this is a fair assumption is because Randy had one. He was a park ranger. Park rangers have full law enforcement capabilities and therefore they are armed when they are out patrolling. However, when they searched Randy's Bench Lake Ranger Station, his firearm was found there, locked up and tucked away. He did not take it with him when he went on patrol. The location that Randy's body was found in also makes the accident scenario very plausible. He was found at the bottom of a waterfall and investigators believe he probably was crossing the stream on a snow bridge, took a step and fell through breaking his leg. Unable to walk and unable to call for help with his radio because of bad signal, Randy would have eventually died from exposure or perhaps been swept over the waterfall. Once again, the terrain in Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks is extremely rugged. It's very unforgiving and therefore I think it's entirely possible that even a really experienced ranger like Randy Morganson could still have a fatal accident mm -hmm. out there. Personally, I think that the accident scenario is the most likely thing that happened. However, there is also some circumstantial evidence that suggests that Randy may have gone out there and taken his own life. First of all, one of the very few benefits that park rangers received back in 1996 was a $100,000 payout to their families if they died in the line of duty. If a ranger were to take their own life, this payout would not be made. Therefore, it's possible that Randy may have ended his own life and then disguised it as an accident so that his wife would receive that $100,000 payout. Now, this, oh. this scenario is pretty far-fetched, I think. I think it would just be pretty difficult to disguise taking your own life like this. But then again, five years went by from the time that he disappeared and the time that he was discovered. And so my understanding is that the condition that Randy was found in wasn't really able to indicate exactly what happened. There's also another really weird circumstance that maybe points to Randy taking his own life or at the very least something bizarre going on. Investigators discovered Randy's park issued radio at the top of the waterfall, not at the bottom where his remains and the rest of his stuff was found and the radio was switched to the on position which suggests that at the time it was last used randy may have been using it in an effort to monitor conversations and perhaps elude the search parties ranger bob keenan who helped search for randy found this very suspicious he recalled searching the exact gorge where randy morganson was found and even recalled crossing the stream at the exact spot where randy's radio was found he specifically remembered that spot because he had used it on multiple occasions in the past to cross that creek. And he insists that if the radio was there when he was searching, he would have seen it. This suggests that maybe Randy had been somewhere else when the area was searched and he had come back at a later time while monitoring his radio. The National Park Service officially maintains that Randy Morganson's death was an accident. When addressing the fact that the area Randy was found in had been searched multiple Multiple times, the Park Service was quoted saying, It's likely that his body was not seen due to the high amount of runoff in the stream that summer. And this very well may be the case. Like I said earlier, I think this probably is what happened. However, it's been 22 years since his remains were discovered, and we still don't really have any conclusive answers as to what happened to Randy Morganson. May he rest in peace, and my heart goes out to his wife and the rest of his friends and family. 
Wow, that sounds... If you watched all the way to the end of this video, I really, really want to encourage you to check out my Patreon. Right now, I have 95 people on there. I really want to get that up to 100 after this video is launched. So if you want to help go above and beyond in supporting this content, please go to Patreon. They all do this at the end, right? Um, the national park stories are, are very interesting and, and sometimes very scary, right? Especially some of the Yosemite and, well, all of them, really. I mean, some of the stuff in the Grand Canyon about people getting lost in the extreme heat. Um, <clears throat> some of the stuff about in Yellowstone of people wandering off the trail and ending up stepping in hot springs and scalding themselves. Um, people falling off of precipices. Um, one of the ones, uh, you know, and, and t tourists are really stupid because tourists to national parks are very stupid. Now, obviously he was a ranger. He knew what he was doing and, um, it's possible that he was trying to evade the search party. That doesn't necessarily mean that he tried to kill himself, right? It could mean that he did you know, have some sort of accident at that waterfall. But there was, um, there's a series of waterfalls in, um, it's not Tenaya Creek. It's like Little Yosemite Valley or something. It's like the way up to Little Yosemite Valley, which is a back country section of the park that you have to take the mist trail there are some switchbacks, but they had a huge landslide. I think it was in the 90s or maybe the aughts. They had a huge piece of concrete, not concrete, I'm sorry, granite, that um, came off of the apron of Glacier Point that uh, leveled the beginning of the longer switchback trail. But there is still a place, uh, like, you can take the mist trail up to Vernal Fall. And there is a bridge where you can make a decision as to whether or not you want to take that switchback trail or you want to continue on with the mist trail, which is, is a very strenuous, steep trail. I've done both of them. And, um, at the top, um, so Vernal Fall is the... The smaller fall and then above that is Nevada fall that's further up the trail and there are times when it seems like these waterfalls dry up maybe there's just a trickle of water coming through them so one of the stories I read was a dumbass tourist because there are no guardrails to these things it's not like they're these are national parks they do not have to put up guardrails and protect you from nature. It's up to you to be responsible and not fall off of things and not do stupid crap, right? At the, the lip of Nevada Fall, one year, um, I think it was a teenager or like a 20-something, a somebody, somebody young and stupid, decided to stand in the middle of the lip thinking well there's no water here so this is not a problem right there's only it's just a little wet it's not that big of a deal problem is a lot of algae grows in these rivers and um so he didn't realize how slippery it was so he slipped right off and basically the the granite walls have lots of crevasses and stuff in them which get larger each year because water will collect in them it'll freeze over the winter which expands pushes it out that's why they have a lot of rock falls um so he fell into one of these crevasses he didn't make it all the way down the waterfall and in order to recover his body, the rescue crew, which is always like, it's always volunteer because they always have to get professional rock climbers in order to 
um, do these types of rescues because they don't hi they don't hire them, right? They're not like on staff. Um, but that's a, it's a particular skill that your standard paramedics don't have, right? So they would use rock climbers to um, help recover people who have fallen or, you know, or you need to recover bodies, whatever it is. Um, I think Cliffhanger was one of the movies that's based on this concept. So basically what happened is he falls into a crevasse and in order to recover his body, they had to redirect the waterfall stream because th there wasn't a lot of water, but there was enough that it was making it impossible for them to get to him. They had to redirect it and then rock climb up there and fish his body out of that cur like crevasse, basically, of, of granite that was on the side of the cliff. But this is why they call it the, the River of Mercy. It's the most dead, deadly feature in Yosemite. And um, it's because people always underestimate what's going on with that river. Whether it's got a little bit of water, whether it's got a lot of water. Um, it uh, is constantly being underestimated, especially in that particular section of the park. And when you think about it, I mean, th these would be absolutely horrifying ways to die. Like, for instance, don't let your kids just, like, start wading around in the river um, up in that section of the park. Because if they, if the stream does take them away, and it only takes about, like, a foot of water to wipe your feet out from under you, there are so many boulders in the river in that section that a lot of bodies have not been recovered because they get sucked under the boulders and people just like you can't find them anymore you have no idea where the body is and um it's not like you can send a dive crew down for something like that because it's just too treacherous so um so if you do go to yosemite be careful don't let your kid like there are specific places in the Merced River that you can wade around in and are a little bit safer that way. Most of them are over by the campgrounds um, or the old campgrounds because they shut a couple of the campgrounds down. Like the Rivers campgrounds after the 96-97 um, El Nino flood, the historic 100-year flood, they uh, let those two campgrounds go back to nature because they determined that they were too low uh, level, too low lying to constantly maintain if um, climate change was going to make it that they had such huge floods. And so you could still go over there and walk around in those areas. They don't, they're not campgrounds anymore, but there are, there is at least one little sandy beach that my mom used to take us to that's over by lower river campgrounds which doesn't exist anymore and there's a few others there's some over by um i think housekeeping camp and um which is a little further down the river and there's like a picnic area too which um has an interesting history of before they changed their bear management policy, they used to have a platform there and uh, feed the bears as like a tourist attraction until they realized that you're not supposed to do that, right? Um, be careful in the parks, y'all. They don't have guardrails up for you. 